Good morning and or afternoon everybody. This is Bill Word and I'm a sales engineer with Digi International and I want to welcome everybody to our webinar today which will cover wireless WAN solutions for use on railroads. Just a little information, I am calling you uh, from Nashville, Tennessee. I work out of my home office. Uh, Digi's headquarters, uh, FYI, is in Minnesota in the Minneapolis area. So uh, we're we're kind of doing this all sorts of remote, so that's good. So our agenda today is obviously a review of railroad applications, and we're going to not really focus on, but we'll talk a lot about positive train control. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can use wireless WAN and cellular technology to solve all sorts of communications problems. We'll talk about where digital devices are deployed and have been deployed in several railroad road applications. We'll talk about which Digi products will help solve connectivity problems, specifically when we talk about things like wireless WAN backup. And just a little bit of housekeeping, due to the number of people that we have on today, our, our questions will be submitted via the questions tab you see there in the GoToWebinar screen. So if you have any questions, we'll try to get to those at the end. Um, I don't think I'll be able to actually address them as we go through, but at the end, hopefully we'll have time. And any questions that we don't get to, hopefully we have your email and we'll be able to contact you via email with any updates and answers that we may miss. The thing we're going to talk about today is going to be this whole railroad ecosystem that, that you see on your screen here where, again, we've got several components that come into building this ecosystem. Pro positive train control is one, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll focus quite a bit on. But we also have applications for monitoring non-PTC related components such as things on the wayside, track monitoring, uh, geometry car, other applications like that. We also do a tremendous amount of business in the passenger train uh, where riders are doing things like Wi-Fi access and also things related to fare collection. We won't really get much into things that can be done in the control center today. We do have console management products and other management products that can be used there. So some things I want you to think about now and as we go through this. One of the most important things is where are your monitoring and control devices? Where do those devices exist? How do you connect to them today? Uh, is it easy to connect to those remote devices? How long does it take to get connectivity to a new device or maybe reestablish connectivity to something that may have broken? How much does it cost to connect to those devices? And what kind of security uh, features do you need? Are, are advanced routing, WAN failover, are those important considerations for you? I mentioned earlier, where are your devices? And if you're dealing with railroads, you know that these devices can be most anywhere. Uh, whether you're a small railroad or a large railroad, your devices are typically in places where you don't readily have phone lines run. It may be difficult to get those lines run. With cellular networks, this is something that we really don't have to worry about like we used to in the past. So what are some of these problems that are solved by wireless WAN? First of all, it can be very expensive to run wires to remote locations. You may have to depend on a phone company to do that or you may actually, if you're a railroad, you may actually own that um, maybe fiber or copper along the track side, but still it's not, it's not cheap to install that. Wireless wind installations have a very low installation cost because there are no wires to run. It can take weeks to get those lines run. Wireless WAN installation can take as little as a few minutes or maybe a couple hours. It doesn't take weeks. You don't have to wait forever because, again, it's wireless. Wires are prone to cuts due to 
uh, natural events, man-made events. I, I normally, when I'm doing something like this, I might show what I call the backhoe slide, where you have a backhoe that's actually cutting into the phone line. Um, there's even theft. We have a customer in South America that, that is helping design a system to help stop a thievery of copper wires used to provide power to passenger trains. Again, there are no wires. It's wireless. And even though you're going to have locations maybe out in the middle of, of a desert or in the middle of a plain somewhere, you might think, well, I won't have cell coverage. But if, if there are any people anywhere nearby, if there's a highway nearby, you're probably going to have wireless WAN coverage because it's really ubiquitous. It's just about everywhere now. You, you may be concerned about security. Oh, it's wireless. I have to be concerned about security. Well, true, you have to be concerned about security, but unlike Wi-Fi where it can be unencrypted, the communication between a modem inside a cellular device and the tower is secure. It uses encoding to prevent it from being tapped into. Uh, oh, you may have heard, yes, that's happened. The people have tapped into it. Yeah, but it's people who have $150,000 or more worth of equipment that they're doing that with, and that simply doesn't happen anymore. The other thing is, is that the cell networks themselves, all of the providers that I deal with anyway, they can almost always supply a private plan, meaning that your data never touches the internet, so it is secure. And finally, the costs are typically less. A per monthly charge in most cases for a wireless WAN plan is cheaper than it is for a wired plan. You pay for how much data you use. Now, that's another confusing thing that people sometimes don't understand about cellular data plans. It's not like your cell phone where, oh, I'm on it for 10 minutes. It doesn't work that way. It's how much data you move per month that you get charged for. And again, typically those plans are very inexpensive. So I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about this slide because as we go through the presentation, I will talk more about these. But these are just some of the applications where our devices are already deployed in railroad applications. Uh, everything from wayside monitoring, positive train control. Uh, I've got customers who have our devices installed on geometry cars, video monitoring of, of things like bridges, draw bridges and, and tunnels, uh, passenger Wi-Fi access. Even environmental monitoring where a certain uh, mass transit agency has a rule that says the temperature on the coach cannot exceed a certain temperature. I think it's like 82 degrees. And they have to monitor that, else they actually get fined. So that's just some of the places where our devices are used. And again, we're going to talk in more detail about these as we go through. Who are some of our customers? And, and we don't mention company names unless we have specific permission from the company to do so. So we respect that. So I'm not going to talk about any particular customers today. But I can guarantee you that some of the largest railroads in the United States and in all of North America are our customers. We have railroad customers in Europe and South America. I, I'm not familiar with Asia, but I believe we have customers there. We work with the locomotive OEMs for installing uh, products on the locomotive for monitoring wireless communication for monitoring of devices on the locomotive. Uh, I mentioned we already have at least one customer who's a geometry car OEM and a lot of different trackside manufacturers as well as companies who install and distribute products that are used on the trackside. So let's talk a little bit about safety and, and specifically positive train control. As you see my nice little animation come up on your screen there. So we're going to talk about not only devices that are trackside, but also ones that are on the locomotive. Most of you, if you're a railroad in the United States, you know that positive train control was mandated by the U.S. government in, in, in 2008 due to some very unfortunate events that happened that caused loss of life. PTC must be deployed, at least that's the plan today, by the end of 2015. 
positive train control is designed to help prevent accidents, and, and, and those accidents can be train-to-train -train collisions, uh, derailments for specifically excessive speed here. Uh, we don't want trains to go into locations where there's maintenance being performed, and we have to be careful that trains uh, don't go through a switch that's left in the wrong position. For example, the switch says the train should go straight, but unfortunately the train went right instead. Uh, every time I think of this, there's a, there was a movie out recently, and I can't remember the name of the movie offhand, but it starred Denzel Washington, and every time I think about that movie, I, I can understand, you know, it's a good example of where this comes into play. One important piece of this, PTC is designed to automatically stop or slow a train before something bad happens, okay? That's a key thing to remember here. So communication to the PTC systems on board the train as well as those that are trackside are things like a 220 megahertz radio system. Uh, there along the trackside there are leased and private copper lines and, and this is going to be important to our discussion today, using cellular or other wireless WAN technologies for backup of those critical and non-critical systems, and in, case, in, in some cases, they're primary for non-critical. And again, loss of communication to the systems on board the train can cause the train to stop. Think about that. As I wait for my slide to advance. Okay. So... PTC is designed to automatically stop or slow a train. You can imagine, especially if you work for a railroad, stop trains cost money. They cost money, they waste time, uh, they, they affect not only your bottom line but your customer's bottom line because the customer sitting there waiting on that freight to be delivered to them. You need some type of very reliable WAN backup for those critical PTC systems. So that's what our wireless WAN routers provide. First of all, it has to be reliable. Our devices for years, and we've been doing the cellular stuff for quite a number of years now, and early on we developed a, a mechanism called SureLink. And SureLink is there designed specifically to help maintain a persistent always-on connection on the cell network. The other thing that, that you want to have support for is carrier diversity. You want to say, I want this product to be able to support carrier A, oh, but it also needs to support carrier B. And even if carrier A and carrier B may use different technologies, such as one is GSM and one is CDMA, you may need to have multiple Ethernet and or serial ports on those devices. Oh, you might also want to have maybe GPS, although most of the locomotives I know of have fairly sophisticated GPS systems already built into them. But you may want that cellular backup device to also support GPS, perhaps to back up that, and other types of I.O. connectivity. You may need some sophisticated routing protocols in this device. You need intelligence for WAN failover. Even though the cell networks, as I talked about before, provide that security you may have rules that say, I need to go beyond that security. I need VPN. I need to have stateful firewall. I need to have advanced user authentication, meaning that we're going to use things like Radius to authenticate those users who log into this device to monitor and manage it. I may need to have different user levels. I want to have an administrator user, and I want to have a read-only user. Obviously, if it's going to be in a, in a locomotive or even in a trackside device, it needs to be rugged. It has to be able to withstand high temperature ranges, vibration. We need to be able to support external antennas, and those externals are not only for our wireless WAN and cellular connectivity, but also for Wi-Fi. Our devices, and, and again, I'm going to talk in more detail about this when, when we get to that point, but uh, the Transport WR44, for example, supports Wi-Fi. Uh, when we talk about passenger connectivity, obviously it's a Wi-Fi access point, but in a lot of cases when this is installed on a locomotive, you want to have a device that can use Wi-Fi client so that as it gets into a yard where there's already Wi-Fi, you can, you can change from using the cellular to Wi-Fi because it's faster and there's no cost involved in that. 
And finally, you might want a device that has some type of customization support. Digi has utilized the Python programming language for that. Uh, I've had a lot of trained customers who have used that Python functionality to do all sorts of interesting customization to the device for their own needs. They want to be able to do a certain thing maybe with the GPS data. That's where the Python functionality comes into play. I do apologize for that. I forgot to uh, turn off my weather radio in the background, and that's what that was. It's the weekly test of the radio. Uh, so let's talk about non-PTC monitoring applications. Here we have both wayside devices and devices on vehicles. So from a non -way, uh, from a non PTC wayside application, there's a lot of things out there, and and all of these uh, functions that you see here all behave very similarly uh, from a communication standpoint. And, and these devices include our hot box detectors to check on the temperature of wheels as they go by, automatic equipment identifiers, and if you don't know what that is, it's basically like a barcode that's on the side of a box car for example. Um, load impact detectors essentially making sure the wheels on the train are round and they don't have flat spots on them. I have customers who do seismic monitoring in, in places like on the west coast where there are earthquakes and, and, and slides and they want to be able to make sure that you know something isn't blocking the track or something bad hasn't happened in that way. Uh, even wind monitors load detectors to make sure that the load on the train isn't too high or too wide to go under a bridge or through a tunnel. Video surveillance and monitoring, uh, things like bridges and other, uh, other type applications. The, the common thing that most of these devices have is that they are all typically serial or Ethernet or in some cases both. And the devices that we supply, the box devices anyway, all have both Ethernet and serial ports on them. Um, and again, being able to do this from a, a wireless WAN perspective means that we can have these devices out remotely and we don't have to worry about running communications wires to them. Some vehicle applications that we've seen, again I mentioned a geometry vehicle and this is one that I've been dealing with for several years now where we have not only railroads themselves who have implemented our product in their geometry cars, but also we're working with a geometry car OEM in providing connectivity uh, to that. The nice part about it is is that the geometry car, formally you would basically have to uh, offload the data when you got back to a depot or, 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 or some type of office. Now with having wireless WAN, cellular technology, on the vehicle itself, you have immediate access to that data. And not only does it have access to the data, but also the workers in these vehicles have immediate access to resources on the network. They can do email. Some other applications that we see are uh, video monitoring of the tracks from vehicles, crew vehicles, essentially anything that moves, any kind of maintenance vehicle, if you want to be able to track that and monitor that, we have the communication capability. We have products that have GPS built into them. So some of the other applications we see out there, uh, crossing monitoring uh, and control, are the lights on, is the gate down, uh, those type things, very critical applications there. Tank monitoring, something that a lot of you probably haven't thought about, but my guess is if you're a railroad, you probably own a lot of storage tanks for fuel and other things. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail about that in just a minute. Uh, energy monitoring conservation, uh, this could be at, at a facility somewhere. We have a lot of products that are used in the smart energy space. Video surveillance, most cameras like you see pictured here, a lot of times they're Ethernet based cameras. And not only do can you use our, our routers to route that data from the camera, but also the serial ports on our products are a lot of times are used for the pan, tilt, and zoom control of those cameras. Uh, that we've been dealing with that application in traffic management for many years. 
the fleet management I just talked about, things in the data center, for example, we have um, console management products that can be used to monitor routers and switches and servers that you may use in your data centers. And in out-of-band management, that's another thing that we do a lot of where there's a remote network device out there and maybe the digi device isn't being used to actually route the data, but we're being used for out-of-band management to make sure that those, that networking equipment is performing properly and to provide network administrators out-of-band access to those devices. So changing gears just slightly, uh, we've been involved in the tank monitoring industry for quite a number of years. Um, we have some very large chemical companies, for example, that utilize our product where they have tank farms. We have petroleum companies that are our customers. And I, I, while I haven't necessarily seen this deployed today by railroads, I think it's certainly an application that, that if, if you do work for a railroad and you were involved in any of this, to think about. It's, it's very expensive to have to send somebody out to a tank farm just to look to see whether the tank is empty or full. We work with manufacturers that, that, that manufacture tank sensors. Uh, MASA, for example, is one of our uh, partners that you see in the upper left-hand corner. And they embed our wireless technology inside their sensor. But there's also other sensors that may be RS-232 based, or maybe they are digital or analog I.O. Or maybe they're a OEM manufacturer and they manufacture their own sensor and their own wireless technology, but they use a protocol called Zigbee. Zigbee is a wireless mesh networking technology. So what that does is that builds a little network, a low bandwidth, low power network to communicate little bits of I.O. between the tanks and, in this case, a Connect Port X4 gateway. And what this gateway does is it provides access from these sensors wirelessly back up over an IP network. In this case, it can be cellular or it could actually be hardwired Ethernet through our iDigi cloud, which I'll touch on briefly shortly, back to a tank monitoring application. And what this does is it gives you, the customer, the ability to immediately see okay, I've got plenty of diesel in this tank, I don't have to send anybody out to fill the tank. Or it can say, ah, the tank is down to a quarter, you need to send somebody out to fill the tank up. And you can monitor that immediately and in real time. So that's a little bit about tank monitoring. Recently we've had tremendous interest in using our wireless WAN products for passenger rail. Uh, mass transit, where mass transit agencies and even private companies for buses and coaches, but we're talking about trains today, want to be able to provide passenger convenience to increase their ridership. That's really what they're trying to do here. They want to entice people to use mass transit. One of the things they want to do is say, hey, we have Wi-Fi on the train. So that means I can use my laptop or my, my handheld phone in Wi-Fi mode so that I've got free access to, or maybe not free, they may charge for it, but typically it's free, uh, to the Internet. So using our wireless WAN technology through uh, typically our DigiTransport WR44 product, we can provide that Wi-Fi access. Some of the things that you know, uh, rail agencies say or transit agencies say they need to be able to do. Well, I want to be able to present the user with a, some people call it a splash screen. Uh, it, we call it a hotspot mode where it pops up the screen and says, you, uh, you know, here's a disclaimer, use this at your own risk, uh, you have so many minutes, blah, 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 okay? And the transport supports that. They want to be able to provide content filtering because, well, not to go into detail, you can imagine what that means. I don't want the guy sitting next to the little kid from downloading something he shouldn't be downloading. And we can redirect that traffic to what are called content filtering services. And essentially, the content filtering isn't done directly on the device. It's done through a service that, that the transit agency uses. Probably most importantly here is you have to have something that's very rugged. It has to be able to withstand the heat and the vibration that we have um, on, on, on train cars. 
Another application that we see a lot of interest in is in fare collection. Now, previously when we talked about fare collection and, and the ones that we worked in, it's it's off board, meaning it's it's uh, maybe at the station. There's a fare card machine. It takes a credit card. It spits out a fare card. But now we're beginning to see that being done on the train itself, whether it be a, a fare card or maybe even in the future a credit card, and maybe even now we've got customers doing that. You have to be concerned with security, uh, something called payment card industry data security standard. That means it has to be able to be uh, possibly VPN. It has to have stateful firewall. A lot of the things that I talked about previously that you use for PTC also apply to being able to take uh, payment cards for fares. Obviously, it has to be rugged, just like it does for Wi-Fi. We also see applications for video surveillance. Uh, I've got a camera. I want to see what's going on, and I want to have immediate access to what that video camera is showing. And, and I mentioned earlier the coach temperature monitoring. So these are some of the things we see in the mass transit and, and, and rail application. And oh, by the way, with the security in a transport WR44, you can provide that Wi-Fi access to the passengers, and you can keep that data off of the network that is also being used for the fare collection using port isolation that we have on the transport, meaning that we can segregate the traffic for one application from another application. So what does a cellular or wireless WAN router look like? What are the features that you want to have in a product like this? And I apologize for the busy slide. I know there's a lot here, but let me kind of go through some of these things. So from a basic standpoint, you want to have a device that's rugged. It needs to be able to withstand uh, broad temperature ranges and vibration. Here we're showing our transport WR44R. And the R stands for rugged, and you can see that it's enclosed in an extruded aluminum cabinet. Uh, there's no vents on this thing to let dust and other things in. You need to be, you need to have external antenna connectors so that I, I can connect externally for my cellular connection and or my Wi-Fi connections. It needs to be fairly small, uh, and you can kind of get an idea here by looking at the size of the Ethernet ports and the serial port on this, that this box is just slightly larger than, for example, the VHS tape, if you remember what a VHS tape looks like. It needs to be secure. Some other things, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, it has to be able to, well, it, it needs to have an embedded module in it. You don't, you don't see any USB modems or other type of modems sticking out here. Digi only uses quality embedded wireless WAN modules. And we need to have diversity, meaning that I can change from one technology to another. I may need expansion in this device so that I can support things like GPS or uh, serial, uh, more serial ports or perhaps digital or analog I.O. We have all that capability in this product. Flexible power meaning that I can supply this thing off of AC or DC power. So this kind of gives you a snapshot of what one of these products might look like. In fact, it does look like this. We, we, we really have a lot of products that, that can be used in a lot of different applications within the rail industry, whether it be on train or on the wayside. But we have three core products that I really want to talk about today. I, I sort of already introduced you to the Transport WR44, but I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. We have customers who want to take cellular or wireless WAN technology, and they want to embed it into something that they have designed. That's where our Connect Core 3G comes into play. And then finally, for specific applications in Europe, we developed a product called the DigiConnect WAN and GSMR. And again, that product was designed specifically for some requirements for European railways. Now a little bit more detail about these products. So the DigiTransport WR44R is a product that's based on our very popular DigiTransport WR44. We just take it and we put it in a more rugged enclosure. 
Embedded in this is a 3G Gobi module, and yes, 4G is coming. In fact, the, the next iteration of the 3G Gobi module that we're using does support technology called HSPA+, which most GSM carriers deem as 4G. From a port perspective, a physical port perspective, there are four Ethernet ports on this product. There's one serial port minimum, but it is expandable to more than that. There's a USB host port on here, and that USB port can be used for things like uh, extra memory. We can store configurations on there, and we can actually load configurations dynamically into a device from the USB port. From an optional standpoint, there, there's Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi is both access point and client, and there is multiple SSID support. And if you remember from the slide I showed you a minute ago, there's GPS capability as well as CAN bus if you're putting this in a, in a uh, vehicle that, that needs CAN bus connectivity, as well as some other I.O. and serial port options. It's important to be able to support external antennas, and we have that capability from this product. Variable power. Uh, most products will ship with an AC power supply, but you have the ability to operate this device off of, for example, 12 to 24 volt DC. Uh, for 72 volt systems, there's converters available to convert that down. And oh, by the way, can't really get into detail about this much, but we are working on some future products that will be more in line with supporting that capability. Uh, again, there are small devices on the front. You've got LEDs so you can see what's going on. I'll talk in a few minutes in more about the dual SIM capability. From a software perspective, our devices, and this is true for all our devices, they all have a secure proprietary operating system on them. In the case of the transport, it's called SAROS. The device supports standard routing capabilities, and it is a router. We don't call it a cellular modem, as a lot of our customers do, but it's well beyond a modem. They support network address translation. There's advanced stateful firewall capabilities in it, and the firewall can do things not only to keep the bad guys out, but to do things like port translation. We have VPN support, and even though I mentioned earlier most of the carrier plans out there can be made secure, a lot of companies say, you know what, I still need end-to-end -end security, and there's VPN support built into the transport to provide that. We also support dynamic routing protocols. We support advanced failover through several different mechanisms. For example, I talked earlier about the ability to use the Wi-Fi client so that when uh, the, the, the train or, or whatever the device is is within access of a Wi-Fi access point, it can use that because it's faster and cheaper, and then it can change over to cellular when it gets out of range of Wi-Fi. In, in cases where there are multiple Digi devices deployed or even other, either, uh, other routers that support technology called VRRP, that provides complete redundancy of not only the wireless WAN itself, but also of the router. Uh, for applications that need COM port access to serial ports, we have a, a protocol and a driver called RealPort that, that allows an application to see those remote serial ports as real COM ports to that application. From a management standpoint, there are several features. All of the Digi devices have a very easy to use web interface built into them. Uh, there's a full command line and there's optional remote management. And I spoke briefly earlier about Python programming capabilities. Uh, that gives you, the customer, the ability to do customization on the device. Uh, for example, I've, I've had customers who wanted to handle GPS data differently than we normally do on the device. No problem. They write a little Python script. They handle the GPS differently. Uh, all sorts of things that you can do with the Python programming. And, and the nice part about Python is, is two things. A, it's easy, and B, there's no licensing on it because it's open source. And we also have a Python wiki that has a lot of existing things that have already been done in Python. Now, some of you out there may be interested, especially if you're an OEM, although we actually have a railroad who's developed some functionality themselves, I want to embed that technology in a custom solution I'm building, maybe something that may go in a carge cage system inside a locomotive, that's where the Connect Core 3G comes into play. The Connect Core 3G is a system on a module, and it's based on technology we've had around for years. And essentially what we've done is we have embedded a Gobi 3000 module, and stand by, I'll talk more about the Gobi in just a minute, a Gobi 3000 module on here so that it can work on either GSM or CDMA. 
it's pre-certified, meaning that we have already pre-certified this, at least in the United States, on AT&T, Sprint, and Verizon. It has GPS support built into it. It's iDigi manageable. Uh, it's got a full operating system on it that even includes VPN support built into it. Like the transport I talked about, it has Python programming capability, so customization is easily done. It supports a wide temperature range, so that means it's going to work fine inside a hot locomotive or a cold Wayside box. And it's future-proof. You, the customer, when the modules are released, and we have the technology available for you from a firmware perspective, it's a fairly easy upgrade path to 4G. And again, that's our Connect Core 3G aimed at embedded technology. If you're in Europe, you may be familiar with something called uh, ERMTS. I'm not that familiar with it, but it's the Europe Rail Traffic Management System. And we developed a, a, a product specific to that. It works on the GSM network, which is predominant in Europe, and it's called the DigiConnect GSMR. So I ta I've talked about this a little bit. Carrier diversity is really something that, that we have found that customers really want and demand. In fact, we've, run, we've won several opportunities specifically because we had this technology. We were f one of the first adopters of Qualcomm Gobi technology. And what Qualcomm Gobi technology is, let me kind of give you a little education here. So uh, back in the old days, when you purchased a cellular modem, it was specific to either GSM or CDMA. And on CDMA, it was typically specific, specific to the carrier that you were using. So that meant that if you used three different networks, you had to buy three different products. You had three different SKUs. You couldn't change this device that was built for carrier A to carrier B. With Gobi technology, which by the way was really pushed hard by laptop vendors, they came up with a way to have this module quote unquote software programmable. And it's really cool because with one module, I can support all these different technologies. I can support GSM and CDMA. In the United States, it supports CDMA on Verizon and Sprint. And it supports both the 2G and the 3G technologies. On GSM, it's going to work with pretty much any carrier in the world, uh, whether it be AT&T or T-Mobile here in the United States. It can be all the carriers in Canada. Uh, basically, any GSM carrier in the world, this product is going to be able to support. The way it works is, is when the device starts up, you have told it what you want it to use. Uh, there's the wizard, for example, that we have in our DigiTransport WR44, and you say, okay, I'm going to set this up to be a Verizon module. And I know in certain locations, I'm not going to have coverage on the Verizon network, and I'm going to tell it, okay, I want to change that personality to be AT&T. It's extremely flexible with how that works. So again, what this does for you is it simplifies the fact that you can buy one SKU that's going to cover all those different technologies, and if you need to, if a device moves from location A to location B, you can change the carrier that it's using without having to really do much of anything else. Now the other thing that we have for uh, redundancy on networks is dual SIM capability on the transport. While in the United States, it's not really a huge deal because we really only have one main GSM carrier, uh, at least the one that I deal with the most is AT&T. In other parts of the world, it's very important. It's very important because there could be multiple GSM carriers. Um, in fact, I'm going to Argentina next week to do some training, and one of my customers that I'm training, they, they need to rely on, on, on multiple GSM carriers. And with dual SIM in the box, if, if SIM 1 fails to connect, it will automatically fail over to SIM 2, and it, it can do tests to see whether or not SIM 1 is responding. The, the network attached to SIM 1 is responding. We also support APN failover, and APN is a technology specific to GSM, and the APN basically is the thing that says this is how the IP address is going to be assigned to the mobile unit. This is how it's going to communicate on the back end. 
And a SIM may support multiple APNs. So if, if something in the network causes one APM to fail, again, the transport can fail over from one APN to the other. So important stuff for carrier diversity. Now, all this is great and wonderful, and, and again, as I mentioned, we have capabilities in the product to manage them on a one-to-one -one basis using the command line or the web interface. But what if you have thousands of devices out there? Well, that's where the iDigi Device Cloud comes into play. The iDigi Device Cloud supplies two main functions. There's something called iDigi Manager Pro, and iDigi Manager Pro is just that. It provides management of all those remote devices that you have out there. The thing about iDigi is it is a cloud-based solution that we host. So you, the customer, don't have to worry about updating your management system because we do that for you. All you have to do is point your Digi device to the iDigi cloud. We provide you um, your own space through your own user accounts. It's a very secure platform. iDigi goes a step beyond that. We also have iDigi Web Services, and that goes beyond just management. That, that allows applications to seamlessly communicate through the iDigi cloud to remote devices. And there's more information on our, on our site. If you go to iDigi.com, there's a lot more information about the iDigi device cloud. So what if you have an application, whether you be a railroad or an OEM, or maybe one of the wireless carriers that I see on the call today, what if you have something that is so completely custom that we don't have a product for it? Or maybe you do have a Digi product, but there's something very specific that you want to do that maybe standard Digi engineering doesn't happen. That's where our, our, our division called Spectrum Design Solutions comes into play. Spectrum is a wholly owned subsidiary of Digi based in uh, Minneapolis, and they can custom design any wireless gizmo you can possibly imagine. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into all the cool things that they do today, but again, if there's something specific that you need that we don't have that you want designed specifically to solve a machine-to-machine a -machine communications problem, that's where we can engage our friends over at Spectrum, and they can design that for you. Uh, one example of some things that they have done, uh, we've had customers who have come to us who have designed their own wireless thing, and it didn't work. It couldn't pass certifications, and some of the things that Spectrum can do is they can say, oh, I see your problem. It's a simple software problem, and they can even help with certification through the carriers of certain products. Well, again, that's Spectrum Design Solutions. Wrapping up, and I see I've got a few questions, so I want to wrap up so we can get to those questions. When you're looking to install something in a railroad application, it's extremely important to get something that's industrial grade. Everything we make is made to operate in harsh environments, uh, things that are easy to mount. I, I mentioned this earlier, and it, it's worth mentioning again. For cellular technology and wireless WAN technology, we only use embedded modules. We learned long ago that that the the PC cards and the USB modems simply do not hold up well in the environments where our products are used. You need to have rugged, reliable external antenna connections. Um, you need to have the security capability provided by VPNs and firewalls. You need to have reliable power connections and be able to supply DC power to this device. Um, I mentioned the broad temperature ranges. You want to be able to customize devices. That's why we have Python capability. A reliable always-on connection. That's what Digi SureLink is there for. Most of the products we talked about have either a five- or three-year warranty on them. And finally, for management, and also for application development and communication, that's where our iDigi device cloud comes into play. All of these things go together to create products like you see here. Um, we've talked mainly about products in the bottom right-hand corner, our cellular routers, but we make all sorts of 
wireless RF devices. Uh, the product that's that's down bottom left a little bit is called the Connect Port X5. That's a product that we in, uh, that that get, gets installed in in fleet vehicles like semi trucks and heavy construction equipment. Uh, again, we've got the iDigi device cloud to bring all that together. So essentially, we have most any kind of communication product that you need. How can we help? We've been around a long time. We were founded in 1985. Personally, I've been with the company since 1992. We're a U.S.-based company based in Minnesota. We have offices worldwide from uh, England to Germany to India to New Zealand. We're all over the world. We're a public company. We're on NASDAQ, DGII. We make rugged stuff designed to go in harsh environments. Um, we have a, a very broad range of machine-to-machine -machine devices out there. Not only do we make the wireless WAN products I talked about today, but we also make terminal and serial device servers that a lot of people use on, on, on locomotives and other applications where they may have multiple serial ports and they want to aggregate that into an IP network over Ethernet or wireless. We've got a, 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 a de applications development team, so if you want to develop an application that uses our IDG cloud, we have the guys that can write that application for you. And we're dedicated to the future. We're working on 4G, for example, for things like LTE. Those products are coming down the pike very soon. If you want more information, go to our link, www.digi.com, and specifically to railroads, put a slash RR at the end of that. And wrapping up, you need to have something out there that's easy to install, it's fast to install, and you can connect basically any remote device wirelessly. You need diversity. This goes not only for primary connections, but extremely important for WAN backup. You need to have broad coverage, and again, we talked about this, the cellular and wireless WAN uh, networks are basically everywhere now. The other thing that, that I didn't mention earlier, and this is really important to know, you can go out and you can build your own wireless network if you want to, but why? there's already a billion dollar plus carrier infrastructure out there for you to utilize. The network is already there. And the bandwidth is getting more and more and more. As we segue into 4G, we're going to see applications and technologies that are going to go up, for example, to things like 45 megabits per second. So we're going to be able to do more things faster.